UFOs. The real truth. UFOs. What are they? Where did they come from? How did they get here? These are some of the questions scientists are hoping to find the answers to. Since the dawn of mankind, we've looked into the skies and wondered if we are alone. Technology has now advanced to the point where we can venture into space and search for these answers. But perhaps life as we know it has existed elsewhere for millennia, and these beings have discovered ways to manipulate time and space in ways we yet cannot comprehend. This may explain not only the UFO phenomenon, but also the various shapes that have been reported over the years. And just perhaps, there are multiple civilizations visiting our planet as you watch this film. Towards the end of World War II, strange light apparitions called the Foo Fighters were reported in the skies by fighter pilots from both German and Allied forces. These lights traveled at incredible speeds and performed extraordinary aerial maneuvers. When the war ended, neither side had the answers to what the Foo Fighters were or where they came from. 1947 was a monumental year for unidentified flying objects. On June 24, 1947, at Mount Rainier, located near Seattle, Washington, businessman and aviator Kenneth Arnold was flying in a Call Air A-2 single-engine plane while on a business trip searching for a crashed U.S. Marine Corps C-46 when something caught his eye. Arnold explains what he saw. At this point is when I uh, would say approximately is where I had this terrific flash hit the air. My aircraft lit up the inside of my aircraft. And uh, I, I assumed, of course, at the time, in a, in a split second, that it was probably a P-51 fighter that had dove over my nose. And that it was the sun's reflecting upon his bright wing surfaces that caused it. However, before I gathered my wits together, I looked way off here to the north. And that's when I saw where the flash came from. It was an echelon formation of a very peculiar looking aircraft, and uh, they were rapidly approaching Mount Rainier. And it was at about this point when I got here, I could see their their tail surfaces, or the rear end of them, and, and the, second, uh, the second craft from the rear had a more or less crescent shaped look, and it had a hole in the center of it. And of course, I kept falling in my mind that's the damnedest looking airplane I ever saw. I looked at my uh, sweep second hand on my 24 hour clock and they had covered this distance of approximately 50 miles in a minute and 42 seconds. It was placing their speed at uh, approximately uh, 1700 miles an hour, 1781 it came out at, at that distance, uh, which was of course unheard of in 1947. I said, well I tell you, they flew like, erratically like a, like a saucer would if, it, if you skipped it across the water. And of course then all of a sudden, uh, the term flying disc and, and this type of thing or crescent shaped or whatnot was completely dropped and everybody started seeing flying saucers and they've been seeing them ever since. Arnold reported his sighting to the media and the Army Air Corps was extremely interested in what he reported. However, they were highly skeptical of his estimated airspeed of these strange objects. It is interesting to note that around the time of Arnold's sighting, several flying wing designs were being developed by the U.S. military. Two of the largest being the Northrop B-35 and the Northrop YB-49. interesting fact is that one of the aircraft Arnold describes quite closely resembles the Nazi jet-powered Horton aircraft. 
Here, Arnold voices his concerns over how pilot UFO sightings are officially handled. Right here, we've seen something. I've seen something. Hundreds of pilots have seen something in the skies. We have dutifully reported these things. And we have to have 15 million witnesses before anybody's going to look into the problem seriously. It's often been said that if UFOs are real, where is the evidence? Perhaps the real evidence lies in UFO crash retrieval. Due to the research conducted by nuclear physicist and UFO researcher Stanton T. Friedman and others, the details of the Roswell incident have come to light. In early July 1947, on the Foster Ranch in Roswell, New Mexico, there was a terrific lightning storm that evening. The following day, rancher Mac Brazel drove out to check on the herd of cattle and instead found a large debris field of unfamiliar metallic objects, which he assumed were from a crashed aircraft. He loaded up pieces of the debris in his vehicle and drove to the local sheriff's office to report what he had found. The sheriff at the time was George Wilcox. When Brazel arrived and showed the sheriff pieces of the debris, Sheriff Wilcox quickly realized that this material was something highly unusual. He immediately contacted the Army Airfield. On July 6, 1947, Army Intelligence Officer Major Jesse Marcel Sr. of the 509th Bomb Group at Roswell Army Airfield, along with Brazel and Sheriff Wilcox, drove to the crash site. When they arrived at the crash site, Marcel soon realized that the debris was indeed something he'd never seen before. Jesse Marcel Sr. explains what he found at the Roswell crash site. There were just fragments strewn all over the area, an area about three quarters of a mile long and several hundred feet wide. So we proceeded to pick up the parts. We found a piece of metal uh, about a foot, a foot and a half to two feet wide and about but two or three feet long. It's not like you had nothing in your hands. It wasn't any thicker than the foil out of a pack of cigarettes. But the, the thing about that got me is that you couldn't even bend it. You couldn't bend it. Even with a sledgehammer would bounce off it. So I knew that I had never seen anything like that before. And as of, as of now, I don't know what it was. So we even tried sinking a dent in it with a 16 pound sledgehammer. Still no dent in it. One thing I was certain of, being familiar with all our activities, that it was not a weather balloon, nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else, which we didn't know what it was. Over the years, leaked film footage of the supposed crash material has surfaced. Here is some such footage, which has yet to be authenticated by the U.S. military. Until then, it remains nothing more than interesting and may or may not be actual leaked military footage.
Later that evening, at the Marcel residence, Major Marcel arrives home and brings some of the crash materials into the house to show his family. Early in the morning, my dad wanted to show my mother and myself uh, remnants of, uh, of something that crashed out there. He had pre-positioned the material on the kitchen floor, and he got my mother and myself up to look at this. Okay. So I walked into the kitchen. And I saw all this junk on the floor. I thought, what in the world is he doing getting me up at uh, this ungodly hour? So anyway, he says, look at this. So I started looking at the foil. I thought, oh, what is this? This is kind of a strange material here. The next thing I looked at were they, there's some little beams on the floor too. So I picked one on, it looked like metallic. Uh, uh, the strangest part of that was there was some writing or some sort of a, uh, writing along the inside surface of this. When I first saw that, I thought, oh, this looks like Egyptian hieroglyphics, but uh, closer inspection it was not. First Lieutenant Walter Hout was the Roswell-based public information officer who was ordered by General Ramey to release the UFO crash story to the press. And he said, I want you to give it to the local newspapers and radio stations and do it quotation. And all he got in reply was a yes sir and away I went. The Army Air Force has just announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in possession of the Army. Major Marcel flew the crash materials to Carswell Air Force Base in Texas and was ordered by General Ramey to pose with some pieces of a crashed weather balloon. They took pictures of course. They had a whole truck of microphones there they wanted me to, to they wanted some comments from me but i wasn't that good to do that so all i could do is keep a mouth shut and general ray is the one who discussed or uh, told the, the, the newspapers i mean the newsman what it was and to forget about it it was nothing more than a, a weather observation balloon of course which we, we both knew differently Colonel Philip J. Corso describes the events that led up to him viewing what he described as an alien body. I told him, Sarge, how's everything around here? And he said, fine, sir. I told him, you know, they told me to be careful to watch this area because you have a sense of something sensitive here. He said, you want to see it, sir? I told him, yeah, let's go look. And I knew the sergeant, right? He was a master sergeant. I went back and he, there was five crates there, like five or six, I think it was five. I lifted one up, and here's this body there in floating fluid. And I looked at it about 10, 15 seconds, not much more than that. So I put it back down and said, Sarge, come on, get out of here now. I don't want to get you in trouble. And I started to figure, what was that? First, I thought it was a, a child, because it was small. Then I looked at this head and all. Right away. And this was only happened a matter of seconds. Then I put the end back down and uh, the head was different, the arms were spindly, the body it was gray. So right at that moment, I figured, uh, I don't know what this thing is. So like an intelligence business, I just better put it in the back of my head here and wait to maybe in the future I get cooperation so I can evaluate what it is. So I promptly forgot about it. As with supposed leaked military footage of crash UFO debris, Footage of supposed alien bodies has also shown up on the internet, as well as footage of live aliens. Although some footage looks convincing, the possibility of hoaxes cannot be ruled out. Public pressure was mounting for the U.S. Air Force to provide a full explanation of what they found in Roswell in 1947. U.S. Air Force ultimately released the Roswell Report. Case closed amid much public controversy.
The report states that the debris found in Roswell was crash material from the top secret program, Project Mogul, a high altitude balloon program to detect Soviet nuclear testing. gave the following explanation for the supposed bodies found at the crash site. Bodies observed in the New Mexico desert were probably test dummies that were carried aloft by U.S. Air Force high altitude balloons for scientific research. Many believe that the crashed object found in Roswell was disc-shaped. However, some witnesses who claim to have seen the actual debris claim it was a Delta-winged aircraft. In 1952, UFOs were seen over Washington, D.C. multiple times over several weekends. This caused a national security concern and spawned widespread panic. These UFOs violated the controlled airspace above both the Capitol and the White House. Pentagon spokesman for the Air Force at the time, Albert M. Chop, stated that the UFOs would appear on radar, perform high-speed maneuvers, and disappear just as rapidly. F-94 aircraft were scrambled to intercept these UFOs. However, they were never able to gain on these objects. The UFOs disappeared instantaneously from radar as soon as the interceptors appeared on the radar scopes. It seemed like nothing could be done to deter these UFO flights, but luckily after the second weekend of sightings, the UFO wave had ended. The public was pressuring the Air Force for an official explanation, and on July 29, 1952, Major General John A. Samford held a press conference to quell public demand. I'm here to discuss the so-called flying saucer. Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and two thousand reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them, explain them to our own satisfaction. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena, or as light aberration. There have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. Our basic difficulty in dealing with these is that there is no measurement of them that makes it possible for us to put them in any pattern that would be profitable for a deliberate a uh, custom sort of analysis to take the next step. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage. And that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. Even President Harry S. Truman was questioned by the press about the UFO incursions. Did the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, talk to you or concern you about the un unknown and unidentified flying object? Oh yes, we discussed it at every conference that we had with the military, and they never had, when they never were able to make me a concrete report. Do you have any anything on the subject? No, I haven't had anything on the subject. And there's always things like that going on. One aspect of the UFO subject that is often overlooked is that of UFO contactees. These are people who claim to not only see UFOs, but have continuing contact with their inhabitants. Perhaps one of the most famous contactees was George Adamski. 
Adamski's first encounters took place near Mount Palomar, California. Adamski, an amateur astronomer, took some of the most incredible UFO photos ever seen up until that time. He was able to capture photos and 8mm film of UFOs as well as cigar-shaped motherships over the meadow on Mount Palomar. At one point, Adamski was compelled to visit the desert in Southern California, where he claims to have had multiple contacts with visitors from Venus, and documented these encounters in his book entitled, Inside the Spaceships. Former U.S. government employee Madeline Rodifer explains how Adamski used her 8mm camera and filmed UFOs in her front yard as she watched. Him, he said, okay, I'll do it. So I gave him my camera and he laid his down and we filmed it on, he filmed it then. I started, you know, but I wasn't sure of myself and I didn't want to miss it. So I gave the camera to him and he finished filming it. But I was, you know, humping around in the background and, and able to walk, of course, with, uh, without too much difficulty because it's cast. In. But they, they only stayed about approximately 10 minutes. They did not land, they did not get out of the spacecraft, but there were glimpses of people through the round windows. And they, they maneuvered, they came in here, it was a low humming and a low swishing sound, and they came in, when they got close to here, they came in very slowly, and was, it was round, and there were three of these well, about this size, I guess. These landing gears underneath, and they were going like this, retracting in and out. And they told George later, it was for stabilization. Um, if they put all of them out, they would have had to land. And they kept one retracted all the time, and the other two were going in and out. But anyway, low swishing, low humming sound. And it wasn't real loud, but there was definitely a motor sound accompanied with it. And, uh, it was a blue, a brilliant royal, uh, between a royal and a purple blue in color. It was a beautiful blue, and deeper blue than this. And uh, it was uh, brown, and as it moved, it looked crooked, you know, and on the film it shows this slight distortion, and it looked, you know, lopsided and so on. But they were moving and, and putting on this performance for Mr. Adamski to back up, you know, his efforts to get the world leaders to tell the truth. Another equally famous UFO contactee is George Van Tassel. It happened uh, on my airport, which I've operated for the last 16 years, uh, at Giant Rock Airport, 17 miles north of Yucca Valley in California, or 40 miles north of Palm Springs. This is an airport used both by the military and private uh, aircraft. Do you own this airport? I leased this airport from the United States government. I've operated it for 16 years since I retired from the flight test business in the aviation. Now, I didn't see the ship land. One of my son-in-laws, uh, that wasn't my son-in-law at that time, uh, saw it come down. Uh, another man on the airport heard it, and uh, he wasn't where he could see it. And uh, the man got off of the ship and approached me before I even knew there was a ship down. Where were you then? What time of day or night was it? It was 2 o'clock in the morning and uh, for approximately a full moon, which is like daylight on the desert. Were you walking about outside or what? No, I was sound asleep when he awakened me. This man awakened? Well, something awakened me. So you got up out of your bed? I got out of my bed and went aboard the ship at his request. This man, in what language did he converse with you? He talked to me in the best English. I asked him what he wanted, uh, because we have a lot of people who come in who are stuck in the sand and broken axles and whatnot. He said, my name is Solgonda, and I would be pleased to show you our craft. Solgonda? Solgonda. Did you, was the craft visible to you at this time? It was when he stated this, I saw beyond him the ship. Well, I hadn't seen before. What did you see? A bell-shaped uh, type of uh, anti-gravity uh, 
ship. How big? Uh, this was 36 feet in diameter and 19 feet high. And where was it? On the ground? No, it was hovering 10 feet off the ground. And how did you, did you go into this ship? I walked with him to a spot underneath it, and uh, an anti-gravity beam took me up through a hole in the bottom. You're telling me that two o'clock in the morning in Jan Rock Airport, you walked underneath this hovering ship, and whammo, you went up no, inside. No, whammo, you went just about as slow as a local elevator. And when you got off the anti-gravity elevator, what did it look like? I was inside of a ship about 18 feet in diameter and uh, roughly 10 feet high to the domed ceiling. And there were three men on the ship, besides the one that had got off and invited me aboard. You keep ca calling a man. What do you mean, man? Well, uh, Little green man? They were about five foot six. They came about to my eyebrows, and uh, they could have walked in our clothes down any of our streets, and we wouldn't have paid any attention to them. Were there any other earthly eyewitnesses to this? Nothing on the outside of the ship. And these people stayed outside? On the airport. And did you go anywhere in this ship? Not to my knowledge. When I got off, it was the same place it was when I got on. Did these people tell you where they came from? They didn't say where they came from, but I've been in the air game since 1927, and their instruments were unlike anything I'd ever seen before. The difference was that we used dial instruments, and they used vertical instruments, like the fluorescent tubes with marks on them. Instruments were marked in symbols similar to hieroglyphics. They were not in any language or number system we use on the air. Earth. Can you give me the formula for the time machine? That's the man. And uh, what form did the formula take? Did he implant it in your mind by telepathy, or did he give you something written in English? English? He spoke it to me verbally. And you remember this? There's nothing to it to remember. Well, you tell me now. The yeah. formula for the time machine. F equals one over T. F being frequency and T being time. After his encounter, he changed the name of the airport to the Giant Rock Interplanetary Airport and began hosting UFO conventions where many supposed UFO contactees attended, including George Adamski. Van Tassel used the proceeds of these conventions to build the Integraton, a building that is a machine whose properties supposedly rejuvenate human DNA and can alter time. The Integraton is composed mostly of wood and was constructed without the use of any nails. Van Tassel began construction on the Integraton in the 50s and worked on it till his death in 1978. The structure still stands today. There are many strange UFO cases on file. One man claims that he was given food by these extraterrestrial visitors. Joe Simonson of Eagle River, Wisconsin, sends a yard about an April morning in 1961. A morning when he says he came face to face with another world. Uh, right here is where this uh, flying saucer that UFO landed. Right here, about where I'm standing. And uh, it was a big, huge thing, and uh, I wondered what the heck it was. I was in my kitchen uh, having a bite of lunch. And I turned around, put the dishes in the sink, and I looked out the window. And that's when I first saw this thing coming straight down, just like an elevator. And uh, first I thought the roof went off of my house. And I thought, no, the roof is green, and this is bright. What the heck is it? So. I rushed out to see what it was, and by that time, there was a hatchway opening up in the top of it, just like the trunk of your car. And then there, there stood a little man, I say a little man, about five foot tall, holding up a jug or a, a container, and he motioned, they wanted to drink, he motioned for water. So I walked up to him to get this jug, and uh, I looked at his eyes, and it was so penetrating that I had to look away. So I went to the basement to get this water. I thought, well, they want water, so I'll take it up to them and see what happens. And with that, I brought the water up, and he was looking at me when I first came out of the basement. But I didn't look at his face until I got right up to him. And I looked up, and I handed the jug up with both hands, and I had that same look in his eyes, sort of a penetrating look. And uh, when he 
took the water, I balanced myself with this hand against the machine, and I stepped back a few steps. And then uh, uh, with that, uh, he set the cup down, and he gave me a salute with the back of his hand, a gesture of thanks, I presume. And then, uh, well, I gave him my salute. What am I going to do? So uh, I noticed this little man, the uh, same size of a man, right to the side, the right side of the hatchway, cooking, uh, cooking these pancakes, which I have one here yet. Uh, he was he was frying these these pancakes, and uh, I pointed to him and made a gesture like eating. I thought maybe I get a conversation out of him. Nobody was saying anything, but he. Uh, he didn't say a word. He just reached over and he got a handful of them, four of them, and he handed them down to me. And uh, they were hot and greasy. And this uh, man cooking these pancakes, it was on a square uh, grill-like concern. I couldn't see any flame, but it seemed to be very hot. There was smoke coming from it. And uh, if that was their food, God help them, because I took a bite of one of them and it tasted like a piece of cardboard. And uh, that's what they lived on, no wonder they're small. And with that, he reached up and he closed his hatch with a heavy thud, quick like when it latched. And you couldn't a bit more see where that hatch was, and you could see a hole in my hand. And uh, with that, the thing started to rain. The bucket came down. Everything was time perfect. It went up about 20 feet. It filled at 45 degrees, straight south, and shot off. And within uh, two or three seconds, it was out of sight. Well, there I stood in the driveway with a handful of greasy pancakes and my mouth open, wondering what the heck I saw, what had happened. It was outside the realm of the airport to pass judgment on Mr. Simon Pitt's table. However, the pancakes that he turned over to the airports were turned over to the food and drug people, and they were analyzed as pure buckwheat pancakes. According to the Food and Drug Administration, the contents of the pancake was hydrogenated fat, starch, buckwheat hulls, wheat bran, and soybean hulls. Photographic evidence has been around since at least the 1940s. The following witness has taken several photographs that have withstood scrutiny since they were publicly released. On August 3rd, 1965, Rex Heflin, an employee of the Orange County Roads Department, was on duty driving through Santa Ana, California. His job was to look for obstructed street signs and report them. I had the camera ready because I wanted to photograph of these trees and the obstruction. I knew it was something different. It was not a, uh, uh, definitely not a helicopter or uh, an aircraft as we know them. First observed it out the uh, left window of the cab, and I thought it was a conventional aircraft at the time. However, just a second or so later, it became obvious it wasn't a conventional type aircraft, and uh, attracted my interest to uh, the point of picking up the camera and actually taking uh, a photo of it as it crossed the road in front of me. And uh, I simply took the camera and aimed a quick picture and uh, these type come out and are polished out of the camera. Another sequence followed as the object moved across and out the other side, the right-hand side, and it was removed. All of these photos develop outside the camera. Well, this photo is uh, the number one photo taken through the windshield of the cab, followed by a number two photo out of the right-hand window, and then, of course, the number three photos. After taking the third photo, the UFO wobbled wildly, then leveled out and headed towards the Santa Ana Freeway. Then the UFO shot off, leaving a smoke ring in its wake. Heflin raced to the area near the smoke ring and took the final photo of the smoke ring as it rose in the sky and dissipated. photographs not because I took them but because what they uh, portrayed and, uh, and show and uh, as far as the rest of it I could care less as to who believes what because I know what I saw. Next we look at a UFO case with multiple witnesses. 
on March 20, 1966, in Dexter, Michigan. Father of ten children, Frank Manor saw something he couldn't explain. Well, uh, first beginning, uh, we were watching television, and we have six dogs here, and they started raising a fuss, and I say they never do much, so well, I went outside, and gave a yell at them, and as I turned around to come back on the porch, I looked to the north of me, and uh, there were, looked like a fallen star, uh, there. It was red and kind of coming down on a 40, about a 45. And so then I watched it and I was going to see if it landed and then maybe go down and see what it was. And uh, when it got to the top of the trees, it stopped and a, a blue and a white light come on. And uh, I looked at it and I thought I was seeing things. Frank Miner's UFO remained over his swamp more than four hours. His children saw it, his in laws saw it. Residents of the area saw it. The police saw it. Even over here, look, beer bottles thrown. Look at my windshield. What would you think if somebody was throwing beer bottles at your house, standing out in the middle of the road screaming, uh, you nut, the fanatic, and all that? What would you think? Are you sorry now that you did tell people what you saw? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm sorry because it, 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 not that it, it, it's not the truth, but it's just the idea, the reaction of the people. They think you're a nut. Tell you the truth, that's just what they figure you are. And I'm not going to take it from what I don't want nobody down in here. I, I just leave me alone. And if, it, and if the thing lands right there, and right there by that pump, I'd never say a word. Then he got out and talked to me. I wouldn't tell nobody. That's just the way I feel. I'm bitter and, and disgusted in the whole matter. And uh, if, if people's going to act like that, I hope one lands right in Ann Arbor, right in the middle of Detroit. No one photographed it, but Sergeant Noel Schneider of the Sheriff's Office remembered it well enough to draw it. No, it's... Uh moved very rapidly at any speed or rather any direction it wanted to go. Why it could change and go to the right or the left or go crossways uh, without hesitating a bit. What do you think it was? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. William Van Horn, Hillsdale's undertaker and civil defense director, also spotted the UFO and was out with his Geiger counter next day, checking a mysterious perfect circle where the UFO had been seen. Van Horn did not find any radioactivity here, but this did not shake his certainty that he had seen a hovering vehicle with two lights. Many people asked him why he did not go right up to the UFO in the dark. I'd uh, much rather be a live caller than a dead hero. And uh, with the area of uncertainty that we have here, uh, how do I know but what uh, maybe, uh, maybe there's a current uh, a little electrical charge which is being uh, radiated by one of these vehicles which would uh, uh, electrocute you if you got within a certain area of it. There was no sound whatsoever. I could not hear a, uh, a bit of sound. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, Project Blue Book consultant for the Air Force, gives his scientific opinion as to what he thought the residents of Michigan saw. I've had many, many letters pointing out that um, they, as children on the farm, had had many experiences with swamp lights and that this was obviously the thing that it was and they couldn't understand why the people in Michigan got so excited over swamp lights. And the illusion of motion frequently is given by the fact that a little bit of swamp light appears here, it goes out, another one appears over here, that goes out then, but the illusion as viewed from a distance is that the objects have moved back and forth. And sometimes this gas will gather into a ball and actually float away. Well, of course, by the time I arrived, the situation was so charged with emotion that it was impossible for me to do any really serious investigating. I had to fight my way through reporters to interview the witnesses. Well, the pressure was mounting for an official explanation. There were more than 60 newsmen jammed in at that news conference. I gave what I thought to be at that time the only scientific explanation possible for the faint lights in the swampy area. I made the statement that it could be swamp gas, and even though I went on to emphasize that I couldn't prove it in a court of law, that that was the full explanation for these sightings. Well, the press picked up the phrase swamp gas and rushed off to the telephones, and I was to come into a great deal of criticism over it. Gerald R. Ford, former Michigan congressman and 38th president of the United States, discusses the Michigan incidents. What about flying saucers? You've had some Michigan past. Do you really believe in flying saucers? You've 
uh, for congressional investigation. They, uh, we've had several uh, incidents in Michigan in the last uh, week, uh, incidents that uh, many reliable, good citizens felt were uh, sufficient to justify some action by our government and not the kind of flippant answer that was given by the Air Force uh, where they passed it off as a, a swamp gas. The Congress should investigate the rash of reported sightings of unidentified flying objects in southern Michigan and other parts of the country. There have been many UFO cases where the object caused or left physiological effects. The following witness claims that he was injured by a UFO. On May 20th, 1967, in Manitoba, Canada, engineer and amateur geologist Stefan Mikulak went prospecting for silver and precious minerals. Mikulak wore welding glasses when breaking open rocks to protect his eyes. Some geese in the lake below suddenly started making a lot of noise. Mikulak looked down at the lake. As he looked back up, he saw two cigar-shaped objects with a dome on top hovering above the tree line. One object shot off and the other began descending. As the object came closer, the shape became more of a saucer shape. The UFO landed on a rocky section just ahead of him. A door opened on the lower section and Mikulak could see brilliant flashing lights on the inside of the object. As Mikulak approached, he looked for a NASA or US Air Force insignia, thinking the object was an experimental American aircraft. Mikulak heard what sounded like garbled children's voices coming from inside the UFO and he called out in English, offering assistance. There was no answer, so he tried in several more languages, to no avail. As he reached the object, the light inside was so intense, he had to use his welding goggles to look inside. He said the interior was empty, except for the bright, flashing lights. He looked inside for several minutes, then the door slid shut. Mikulak put on one of his leather gloves and touched the rim of the object, which burned his glove and his fingertips. Suddenly, the bottom rim of the UFO rotated counterclockwise, and Mikulak was hit with a blast of air, which caught his clothes on fire and knocked him to the ground. Mikulak, writhing in pain, removed his burning clothes as the object lifted slowly into the sky and shot off. Prior to approaching the UFO, Mikulak made this drawing. Here are some of Mikulak's supposed burnt clothes from his UFO encounter. Mikulak was admitted to the hospital for chemical burns in a grid pattern. This is Mikulak's actual medical report documenting his injuries. Mikulak flagged down a royal mounted policeman as he made his way home and recounted his story to the officer of being burnt by a UFO. This is the actual report. The Falcon Lake incident became so well known, the Canadian government issued an oval $20 silver coin in 2018 commemorating Mikulak's encounter. Alien abduction is where a human is taken by UFO occupants, tests are performed, and then that human is released. Here, we take a look at one of the most intriguing cases. On November 5th, 1975, in the Apache Sick Graves National Forest in Arizona, forestry worker Travis Walton was abducted by UFO occupants. Well, I was returning from work uh, with six other men. Um, cutting trees in the mountain, uh, forest mountains of uh, near Snowflake. And uh, we encountered uh, this object. I got out to take a closer look and was hit by a blast of energy from the craft. My co-workers fled. I hold nothing against them for that. That was probably the wisest thing to do. I'd have been wiser to stay in the truck. The men quickly returned, thinking Travis was hurt and needed help. But when they returned, there was no sign of Travis or the UFO. The men drove into town and called the local sheriff. The sheriff and deputy responded, and together with the men, 
went back to search for Travis, but he was nowhere to be found. The following day, a massive search party using helicopters, all-terrain vehicles, and dogs was conducted, but no signs of Travis were found. When they reported to the sheriff, they were accused of murdering me, and they all uh, took uh, police uh, lie detector tests. These are the polygrapher's questions. Number one, did you cause Travis Walton any serious injury last Wednesday afternoon? Number two, do you know if Travis was physically injured by any member of your work crew last Wednesday? Number three, do you know if Travis Walton's body is buried or hidden somewhere in the Turkey Springs area? Number four, did you tell the truth about actually seeing a UFO Wednesday when Travis Walton disappeared? The results on Dallas were inconclusive. These polygraph examinations proved that these men did see some object they believed to be a UFO and that Travis Walton was not injured or murdered by these men. I woke up um, on board. Um, I don't know where in the five days it was. This conscious period was brief. I felt severely injured. Uh, when I was finally able to see these creatures uh, standing around me, uh, I pretty much freaked out, flipped out. And it, you know, this was the most terrifying experience of my life. Travis looked for a weapon. Turning around, he picked up a glass rod and unsuccessfully attempted to break the end off and make a sharp weapon so he swung it at the beings. These strange beings backed away and left the room. Several minutes later, Travis looked outside the room and ran down a curved hallway and into a round room with a chair in the middle of the room. Travis sat in the chair and the room instantly became a three-dimensional star map. A man with a blue tight-fitting jumpsuit and a clear domed helmet entered the room and motioned for Travis to follow him. Travis thought he was being rescued and followed the man. They went down the hallway and exited the UFO down a wedge-shaped ramp into a large room housing several more UFOs. Exiting this large room, they entered a small room with two males and a female who resembled the man in the helmet, but these people were not wearing helmets. The female placed an oxygen mask looking device on Travis's face and he lost consciousness. When Travis awoke, he was laying in the road face up. He saw a UFO hovering above him and the object shot off as he rose to his feet. Travis walked back to town and called his brother-in-law to give him a ride home. The crazy thing is that you're with all these other people that say they saw it and you, you you're telling us that you've taken lie detector tests and you've passed them based on this story. Yes, uh, I've taken and passed five of them from um, um, law enforcement entities, uh, uh, state police, uh, uh, New Mexico state police, uh, you know, the, all of them. Uh, over the years, it's just been one after another. But uh, other sorts of tests, like drug tests, or were you hallucinating? <laughs> Uh, you know, seven people are not going to have the same uh, identical hallucination, but, no. you know, every single theory had to be uh, disproved. You know, at the time, I, I took it as, as it's been called, an abduction, but uh, uh, over the years, I came to realize that uh, it was probably more in line, in line of being uh, an ambulance call. That by getting so close, I was hit by some energy accidentally that would have been fatal had they not intervened. And, uh, and somehow help me to survive. Did it, did it? Did anything happen to you after? I mean, did you? I mean, were you normal after that? I mean, obviously it's going to mess with your head, but physically. Well, it was extremely traumatic, and uh, I had a thorough battery of medical tests and uh, EKG, EEG. Um, um, there was a. This was at Barrow's Neurological Institute, the same uh, brain uh, hospital where Muhammad Ali went, and. Uh, there were some interesting results that uh, I'm, I'd like to follow up on. Uh, some anomalies in the reading that disappeared with a, a second uh, EEG. The next case has no publicly available documentation. Only the testimony 
a former U.S. Air Force counterintelligence officer, Richard C. Doty, who is well known for the Paul F. Benowitz case in which there is official Air Force documentation with his name and signature on it. In January 1985, near Cherimkova, Russia, a UFO landed near a Soviet intercontinental ballistic missile base. Four short beings exited the UFO as the base security team responded. As the security team drew closer, one of the beings was shot with an AK-47 and fell to the ground. The other three beings grabbed their fallen member, dragging them aboard the UFO, and the UFO instantly lifted off. Shortly after liftoff, a Soviet missile was fired and struck the UFO. As the UFO fell from the sky, it emitted a red beam of light and disintegrated a jeep on the ground just before impacting the Earth. Security teams rushed to the site and were able to enter the craft through an opening caused by the crash, and the four beings were captured. The beings were three foot five inches in height, wore a flight suit with a helmet that had a hose connected from the helmet to a small tank on their backs. The beings had long arms and had only four fingers with no thumbs. The UFO was dark gray and 30 feet in diameter. The UFO interior was a large sparse circular room with four workstations spaced along the wall. And this was the only room aboard the UFO. The workstations had a large screen a metal chair with a metal pole connecting the chair to the ceiling, and a control panel with no knobs, dials, or controls, only two hand impressions on the panel. It was thought that the beings placed their hands in these impressions and controlled the UFO with their minds. Three of the aliens were taken to a secret facility and interrogated over several days, but the aliens could not or would not respond. Linguists from Moscow were brought in and they even tried to communicate using psychics, all to no avail. The aliens were given food and water, but refused to eat or drink or even remove their helmets. The Soviets thought that if they removed the helmets, the aliens would die. Meanwhile, attempts were made to save the life of the alien who was shot but because pathologists were unfamiliar with the alien's physiology, these attempts failed and the alien died. X-rays and fluid samples were taken. When they cut into the flight suit, they reached layer after layer and were not sure if any of these layers were tissue. Eventually, they reached an internal cavity with a single organ complex comprised of a heart, lungs, and an unknown organ. At this point, the pathologists were so confused, they were not sure if these beings were born like us, grown in a laboratory, or manufactured somehow. On the fourth day, the three aliens in captivity disappeared from their cell while the guards looked away. The entire base was searched and the aliens could not be found. Thinking the aliens were attempting to get back to the UFO, the security team raced to the site where the UFO was being examined. However, when they arrived, the UFO had also vanished. 
The following is an Inside the Skiff exclusive. The following witness has never spoken publicly about his UFO encounter. He wishes to remain anonymous for various reasons. Therefore, his identity and image have been protected and his voice has been altered. This is the first time that this event is being publicly revealed. This event took place in Hollywood, California on April 19, 1980. I'd gone over to my friend's house to visit when she at one point decided she wanted to smoke a cigarette. So we went out onto the back porch and sat on the stairs there. When we walked outside, I noticed there happened to be a ring around the moon that evening. As I was looking in the sky, I happened to notice the aircraft coming up the coast from Los Angeles Airport and making a turn east over the Hollywood Hills, which was their typical flight path. I noticed that one particular aircraft, but the lights weren't as bright as the other aircraft that had just passed by, and this caught my attention. So I continued to watch the aircraft and wondered why these lights were not so bright. I would estimate its altitude to be just below 10,000 feet because I later checked and the cloud level that evening was 10,000 feet. As I watched this object, it was traveling at approximately the same speed as all the other aircraft that had just passed by. So I would assume 100 to 125 miles per hour. I continued watching the object. In front of me was a eight foot cinder block wall. On the other side of the wall was a parking lot that at the time belonged to A&M Records. There was a street on the other side of the parking lot and houses on the other side of the street. The street lights had just come on that evening and I noticed that the object passed over the top of one of the palm trees in one of the homes across that street. And that's when I realized it was no longer traveling at 10,000 feet. It was probably about 75 feet off the ground at this point. The object came into view as it came into the lights from the, the street lamps. I noticed that the object was a triangular black opaque object with white domes on the bottom of it. There were four domes total, three in the front and one in the back. It was an unusual object because the size of the object were perpendicular to the top and the bottom of the object. The leading edge was a long, flat surface. So aerodynamically, this didn't make sense at all. At this point, I pointed it out to my friend and we both stood to our feet and watched the object coming towards us. I would estimate at this time that the object was traveling around one to three miles per hour. It continued coming our direction, and just as it was passing over the palm trees at the edge of the parking lot, I thought the object was going to land in the parking lot. So I jumped across to this eight-foot cinder block wall and stood on top of the wall. I heard a helicopter sound coming from behind me, just over my right shoulder. As I turned and looked up, I saw a Los Angeles Police Department helicopter pass quickly over the house and into the parking lot. I watched it circle behind the object and around to the left side of the object, which continued on its course without any deviation. The helicopter stopped at one point and hovered in position. The object continued coming our direction. Then the helicopter turned their search beam straight to the ground, raced their engine, and ran towards the object, swinging their beam up at a 90 degree angle. As soon as the light hit the object, a laser beam type light on the leading edge of this UFO, I would estimate several feet in diameter, this white laser beam type light emitted from the front of this object. At the exact same time, without changing speed, the object pivoted from the front end down on a 45 degree angle, slid and gained speed. This movement was so smooth, I would equate it to a piece of metal sliding on a piece of glass. And then the back of the object flopped back down and the object continued at its original speed of one to three miles per hour, coming our direction. The helicopter at this time lost sight of the object, and the search beam 
which going all over the sky, all over the ground, they didn't see the object. I continued to watch the object coming towards me, and just as it passed over my shoulder, over my right shoulder, it stopped. And the laser beam light was still on at this point. A few seconds later, the light shut off. The helicopter turned off their light, raced towards the object, and the two of them hovered together. I took my hands at one point, and I measured the helicopter with my hands. The distance was the same as the length of the helicopter from the helicopter to the object, and the two trailing surfaces of the object were that approximate size as well. Here are the approximate dimensions of the UFO. The helicopter was a Jet Ranger Long Ranger, which is just over 42 feet in length. Therefore, the two trailing edges of the UFO were 42 feet each, making the leading edge 60 feet in length and all of the white domes 8.5 feet in diameter. A few seconds later, the helicopter turned their light directly onto the object. And I was not mistaken anything at all at this point. I could see the object in perfect lighting. They sat in this light for about 30 seconds, and then something unusual happened. The object appeared to grow in three rapid movements, and then appeared as a book if you were slamming a book closed, and then disappeared. It was gone. My friend and I couldn't believe what we had just seen. The helicopter at this point, their searchlight was going all over the sky, all over the ground, looking for this object. It did not reappear. We tried to figure out what had just happened, especially the last sequence. You know, how is it possible that a solid object can grow in size? When the object got larger, I couldn't see the helicopter. So I asked my friend, could you see the helicopter when the object got larger? And they said no. So my assumption is that if it had actually grown in size, it would have hit the helicopter and there would have been a mid-air collision right above us. Since I couldn't see the helicopter when the object grew larger, my assumption was that it had come down at an angle closer to us in three jerky motions, and then they either shot off at a terrific speed or went into another dimension or whatever they do. But at this point, the object was gone. We ran inside and told my friend's roommate, and we asked him if we could borrow the camera, and he said, why? And we said, we just saw a UFO, and he said, no, it's a helicopter, I heard it. And we said, can we just borrow your camera? And he said, no. So we ran out the front of the house and went out to the street because we were following the helicopter, which was now running a grid pattern, searching for this object. They're beam searching through the sky, on the ground, all over the place. And Several minutes later, we saw a Chinook CH-47 coming over the top of the Hollywood Hills using their searchlight and also performing a grid pattern. So these two helicopters were operating at the same time over the same area looking for this object. One thing that stood out in my mind was there was no sound coming from this object. Not even during acceleration. Even when the object was directly above me, I heard nothing. And I could feel no heat or downwash associated with either microwaves or any other known propulsion method. To this day, I don't know what I saw, but I can tell you it was not a conventional aircraft of any type. The evidence is overwhelming. Something is going on in our skies. Are we being visited from a distant civilization or another dimension? Or are we seeing the next generation of advanced military platforms? Only time will tell. Perhaps one day, these alien visitors will make themselves known and initiate face-to-face -face contact with the inhabitants of Earth. Or maybe we will be the aliens visiting the other planet. So keep your eyes to the skies. I'm Sai, and you can watch me and ISO on our YouTube channel, Inside the Skiff. Go there now and enjoy this video.